question to question for Sasser. A very quick question, Leslie. When did you actually start to put pen to paper to write Blossom? Uh, it was probably four years ago, or even five years ago, actually. So since then, we have a single police force, mm -hmm. a single fire service. You see where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. It kind of adds a little bit to your argument. Um, and I think that's deeply worrying. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, white paper and you read page after page of new quangle, new commission, new quangle, new commission, we're not progressing. Well, the SNP is not progressing. Yeah, yeah, but what I'm saying is, uh, you know, that's the, that's the direction of travel right well, now before we put our tick on the box. I appreciate that. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's worth just being precise about language here because, after all, um, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities just last week came mm. out with their final report on, on strengthening local communities, which was quite extraordinary, actually. I mean, it, it says very powerful things, more powerfully than I have, um, about, about democracy atrophying over 50 years through a long creep of, of centralisation. And that's not just being pointed at the, at the Scottish Government, that's being pointed at councils themselves. They are too big. <coughs> and not to put, you know, put too many words in their mouths, but they were calling for about 100 councils in Scotland. Mm -hmm. If we had the European average size, we'd have 517. We have 32. Mm -hmm. So you can argue about where you want to end up with, but you know, there's a lot of people thinking you wouldn't start here. Now, I'll quite grant you, this is not an agenda the SNP seem to have grasped. Um, there is a community empowerment and renewal bill on the go, but what that sets up is a welter of quite hard to activate powers that communities might want to exercise. And whilst I'm a massive fan of community power, um, I was, a, some of you may know, a trustee of the Isle of Egg Trust for eight years, which was the first island to buy itself back from a private landowner in the 1990s. <coughs> but nonetheless, what we're ending up with now is because we have this wrong-sized governance structures, we've ended up with community coming to the rescue all the time, trying to fit the bits that basically the official structures don't work well with. So I think it's good that communities should end up with um, more, more power if they're going to be the ones that constantly have to keep coming to the rescue, you know? If we need to have the cavalry, let's give the cavalry good horses. But actually, why do we need the cavalry? If you, if you live in a right-sized democracy like the Nordics, you only need to, to change society, you only need to be a good citizen. In Scotland, you need to be a hero. And that's actually what most of the book is about. It's about people who've knocked their pants in over 10 or 20 years to change one small facet of something very unfair in society, and sometimes have succeeded, like the egg lot, and very often have not, because some bureaucrat somewhere has simply cut small amounts of funding and people have just torpedoed in terms of their energy for life and their, their, their will to continue. So yes, I think the, the, the people have got to try to say some stuff to the politicians, or else take over the reins, actually, because some of these things, which are raised in every meeting I've been at, land, loss of local control, they've really mattered to people, and somehow, if you live in Hollywood too long, you think they don't. Questions came up all, yeah, from, all, all, from, all, all from men. Yes, well, I've that. <laughs> that. After this, it's only women. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be astonished, gals. Come on, otherwise, I'll go around the microphone and ask you questions. It's always nasty. Somebody's saying that if any stalls insist that the, the questions were, were alternated, didn't they? Then, if you want to do that, we can do that. But anyway, I think we're next. Uh, behind the yeah, okay. um, If he wants to go in the direction of um, local needs and caring, you would expect that to include caring for um, the needs of uh, families and times of need to be able to stick together and not be forced apart. So what um, you know, near-term prospects um, does YES offer of, um, by, by following your path, um, of thereby cancelling out the uh, top-down power that YES wants to create to um, refuse citizenship and make it the state's choice or for, for inheritance from a parent for um, Scottish people born in exile, exactly like you and me, who, who don't happen to be resident here on Independence Day, um, and we do, um, we know, you know people who's 
Paris route, which, 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 which prospect of hateful division of families is the reason why I'm voting no. Sorry, I don't really, I don't understand that. I'm, I'm very much yeah. being slow. What's the inheritance problem? Um, the, this, this citizenship by inheritance is not being made an entitlement and right. It's being made refusable by the state to have something else to apply for and not get. Just, can you give me what, for, for example, what's the problem? You won't inherit your parents' But don't you won't be able to live here. You won't be able to live here? Well, I will, because I live here now, but, 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 but there's someone in that situation if they don't already live here on the dependence they might not be able to live here. I still don't understand that. Well, that, that's, that, that, that's, that's in the white paper citizenship plan, and that's, that, that, that's the answer you get when you try to clarify it and try to obtain guarantees that it won't be refusable. Well, I guess, I, I imagine, I mean, I'm not here as Alex's little helper in life, as you'll appreciate, <laughs> but um, I imagine there has to be a moment at which citizenship changes. I imagine it's all on Independence Day, the people who are here at that snapshot of time, and presumably there might be perhaps a little before and after, then become the citizens of Scotland. Yes? Yeah, but that doesn't help. I mean, that, that is, is, no, is, 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 is keeping parents and offspring together as families, not having um, end up fostering in different countries. Well, you, you know, um, that's uh, as somebody who's got uh, parents, uh, well, not parents, but, you know, family actually across very met, probably every single part of the United Kingdom at the moment. Um, we, we all, for example, operate in different health services already. We're already becoming involved. This, the directions that, for example, Scotland and England are taking on, on very many really important domestic issues are already walking in different directions. Now, you may attach a great deal of importance to that last word, you know, the citizenship of things, but to, to my feeling, I am now Scottish in a way that is distinct in my mind from being British already. And in fact, if I'm being honest about it, when I crossed over here, I have Scottish parents anyway. I think I always felt more Scottish than anything else. That's now shored up by a lot of institutions working in distinctly different ways, all of which, to my mind, have a similar theme, which is they're trying to have a more equal, caring state. And that's what, to me, creates identity. I don't stand in front of a flag and feel any flicker of emotion whatsoever, any kind of flag. I feel a lot of emotion when I'm with a bunch of kindred spirits who want to try and create a progressive society and are voting for it democratically and peacefully. That's the kind of country I would like to belong to, and I have belonged to it for most of my life. Can we just move on? Well, to me, a no vote would result in nothing at all changing. With this corrupt thing? Yeah, with this uh, corrupt, inept coalition government, I mean, I can't understand anybody wanting to do. Well, I, I can. Um, you know, right. well, let's face it, right? Is everybody here in peak physical condition? <laughs> right? Do we want to be in peak physical condition? Sort of. <laughs> so why, why are we then? You know, there's plenty of things in life that actually, and I'm not just suggesting that no voters lack motivation. Some people just don't want to be an independent scholar, and that's okay. But I think a large bunch of people in the middle of all that just feel um, it's too much hassle. It feels like a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work getting your head around all the issues. Every single fact that you get presented in the mainstream media, you have to go off and research somewhere else because there's three, not even four, there's not even two sides to things now. There's usually about seven sides to things. You have to work like nobody's business at the moment to stay abreast of it all. And a lot of people just cannot be bothered. The same way a lot of people can't be bothered about getting into peak fitness, despite the fact it would all let, let us live 10 years longer. That seems to me to be as incomprehensible. We are humans. We are weird a lot of the time. So I do understand that. Yeah. One of the things I feel as well, I mean, there's a real apathy, parochialism, you know, connected to Scotland. And I think that's the only side. Well, personally, I'm, I'm, having said that, I mean, some people are not wanting to get involved in this extra bit of sort of, you know, thinking about stuff. And I think there's other, there's, there's definitely lots of other things that are undercurrents in this debate. 
One, the major one of which actually speaks back to that use of the word apathy, because I, I personally don't really believe in apathy. Um, I think what happens is you get rubbish systems, you get situations that are dead ends, and you get reasonably intelligent people deciding not to pour energy into situations that won't get any better. So actually, people withdraw, they've saved their energy for, for more important things around their family. That's the characteristic of democracies, there are 30% turnouts in things. I would blame the structures rather than the people every single time. But the big elephant in the room, I think, in independence is the capacity of the Scots. I think a lot of Scots doubt the capacity of Scots. And some of that arises from the bizarre aspect of why we actually, some of it's about the health issues, for example. Why are we the sick man and woman of Europe? Why are we like troglodytes where we're inside the whole time? Okay, the weather can be a bit iffy. <laughs> Generally speaking, if you go to Norway, you know, they have great sayings, you know, there's no such thing as bad weather, only inappropriate clothing, and so on. You know, why are all these things? And I think you have to take some time to try to understand quite how crippling the effects of centuries of top-downness and having no control or security in Scotland have been on us have been on our grandparents, who shaped our parents, who shaped us. You know, we've, the, the book tries to go into all, all of these areas, much of them are to do with Scots, never mind south of the border. We did a lot of this, there is a lot of elitism in our own history. Scots have, have exploited fellow Scots. And we need to accept that. But what, what I feel that's really important to get is that we start looking at the kind of enormous efforts that ordinary Scots have put in, and I haven't got time here unless somebody wants to ask or whatever about it, but to look at the individual stories of the kind of mammoth efforts that people have made to change their lives. It's not the question that the Scots are kind of lack capacity, it's almost exactly the opposite. If you live in a, in a right-sized democracy, you just need to be a citizen to create change. You just need to vote. You might just need to stand, some people stand for election. That's all you need to do. In Scotland, you need to give 20 years of your life to projects which may suddenly not get funding the next year even. I mean, the egg lot gave 10 years of their lives and raised 1.56 million pounds from private donations. Only 17,000 pounds came from the public purse. And do you know what the first thing they did was? As landowners, eventually, they issued 37 leases. Now you might think that's not much. Well, quite. They had to go through all of that to give everyone who lived on egg a lease for the first time in living memory. Is that right? And when we're at it, what about the capacity of people who are prepared to go through all that pain? For t you know, for the best part of 10 years, they did nothing else. They managed to ignore all the negative voices in their own heads saying, you can't do it, who do you think you are? No one's ever achieved this sort of thing, don't even try. They ignored all of that to be able to come out the other end and simply do what any democratic state would take for granted, which is that if someone's a tenant, they get a blinking lease, but not in Scotland. So my point is, the capacity, I think the capacity of Scots is actually extraordinarily high. Now, people may think I'm mad, but I have been involved in so many community um, projects where it's been exactly that way around. The media don't tell the story, we don't tell each other the story, history isn't interested in the story because our history is the history of great men. And we lose all the accumulative wisdom of all the people throughout history who have, who have basically struggled to make this place a better place. That's who we are too. So I think, I think that's important, because if you think that basically uh, the rest of Scotland, not yourselves obviously, but the rest of Scotland is a kind of incapable rump, then you will not want to be a manacle to them for the rest of time. You will not want Scotland to have more powers, because you're constantly hesitant about the capacity of the rest of Scotland. So this one really has to be laid to rest, because I think that's a large reason that many people are voting no. Got lots of questions lining up now here. Uh, <laughs> take these two ladies first, just to have a female voice. I just wondered what your thoughts on welfare are, because obviously what we see from the coalition is, you know, well, on the personal level, quite frightening. Um, maybe it seems through this incredibly stigmatising, uh, this kind of 
people are deserving or undeserving. Um, and the interesting thing is, they say it's to save money, but almost all of the measures that have been put in place are actually costing a great deal more. So I just wanted to put your thoughts on welfare were around the models that you've looked at. Okay, if we just take all the people that have had their hands up and just get them quickly, right? Well, so the group was marvellous, but it reminded me that a real weird and peculiar rather, Jamaican socialist went around in the 1970s and he couldn't get his head around this house of the lords and the monarchy. He said, What kind of planet are you living in? You know, I mean, he, he said, You know, and yet, if you're thinking it, Tom Payne was white man in 1792 and our parliamentarians who can't, if you want, you could be elected as an MP and unless you give a, a, an oath of allegiance, sit the Scotch Farm, to this feudal monarch, you're not even allowed in. And nobody's saying how, how, how bizarre this is, you know. And I think, you know, it, 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 if somebody's in a lunatic asylum, um, they don't realise how mad they are. So I think you know, the point you make is actually great. But, you know, that was a Jamaican source of saying that. But can I just say quickly, I mean, it's amazing how Westminster, there's Tom Johnson in 1908, who his marvellous book, Our Scots Noble Fathers. And he actually showed how all the aristocrats basically stole the land and how appalling it was. And it's just how the way that the Westminster system actually sanitizes and um, disrupts radicalism, which there has been in Scotland. You know, Tom Johnson, uh, so he eventually tried to buy the book up because he was so embarrassed by it in the late 30s and 40s, but there has been radical challenges. And it's the unique peculiarity of this system that people think, you know, that, that, I think your point is marvelous, you know, but just take it for granted that it's absolutely anachronistic reaction and upset. Well, let me, let me, actually, can I just, there's two, those are two quite junky ones, can I just sure. respond to them? And I'll just take the second one first, with the sort of, uh, actually there's a, there's, there's quite an easy way to relate both those points there, about the extraordinary um, acceptance of things like the House of Lords. I mean, at least here, you can actually talk about the House of Lords, mostly people go, what are they like in Scotland? I mean, it's not like there's a tremendous overweening respect or regard for the, the House of Lords of Chamber. And believe me, if you're broadcasting down south, there is. It is quite a strange thing. I've often found myself guffawing and then looking around the room and realising I'm on my own, you know. But, um, I mean, just recently, there was 22 new members of the House of Lords. Um, seven of them have contributed, I think it was £7 million pounds to party funds, mostly to Conservative party funds. Um, and 17 of them were either politicians or had been politicians or had held political office. Now, as, as, as was pointed out at the time, the House of Lords is meant to be an independent um, second chamber which is trying to check the political party power of the lower chamber and yet the people being appointed to it are not independent. They have had political pasts. So, I mean, it, it is a, a ludicrous abuse of power. But here's, here's the thing that links up that point you made as well about land. Because if we were to chuck in another way that Scotland is absolutely weird, it's weird by being, I think, I'm yet to be corrected on this, the only country remaining on the planet that allows <coughs> male primogeniture in the inheritance of land. But to turn that into English, what it means is the eldest son can legally inherit all the land from his dad, if his dad wills it to him. Now, if it's property, other siblings can contest it, um, but not land, which is the reason that the 10th Duke of the Clue inherited roughly £395 million pounds worth of land, castles, paintings, whatever else it was, and his three siblings got 50,000 quid each. <laughs> now, I'm not weeping for them, I'm weeping for us, because if we had had what was common again in Europe, the Napoleonic Co Code outlawed that differential rights of siblings in 1801. So the rest of Europe has mostly operated on a basis of equality since 1801, not Britain. England abolished primogeniture in 1926, and the reason that Scotland didn't was because the Scottish landowners in the House of Lords blocked it. So it shows you that this is not, they're not, it's not just that the House of Lords are a sort of bunch of funny daddy old boys and it doesn't really matter what they come up with, it's a bit of a, a, it's a bit of a thing, have to pay them 300 quid a day to turn up not to leave. When you look at the, uh, the interest groups that are represented in there, uh, when you look, for example, about the fact these guys are sitting passing laws on privatisation into, for example, the health service, when many of them actually run and have directorships in private health companies, it's 
It's extraordinary that anyone in this country still can refer to the Commons and the Westminster set up as the mother of parliaments. It's ridiculous. ourselves into a zero-sum game uh, from which we must escape. We have now got to a stage where welfare means poor. Um, then you can split into deserving and undeserving poor, but most social democracies don't have welfare states that only apply to the poor. This has been the great failure of Britain. Um, if you were to look, the Danes, for example, who do extremely well, many more of things, particularly child well-being than us, they're generally top of that table. And the way they would look at it is that they would aim to have services that are um, attractive to the affluent and affordable for all. And that way you don't have the middle classes opting out. That's what's happened here. Nobody who's got enough money uses council or folks homes, for example. Everybody, the, the great fear here, although I'd say actually the Highlands have now got a pretty good track record, but you know, some, in some places, okay. But in general terms, the services offered by the state are for the poor. And if you can manage to kind of find a way to get yourself out of that, then you probably will. That that is where, that is a leakage in the virtuous circle that needs to keep pumping like a heart to keep belief in social solidarity high so that people pay taxes. The whole thing works virtuously or, as in the case of Britain, very unvirtuously. So, for example, somebody in Denmark will probably pay taxes at you know, 47% or whatever it is because they know they will get some of the best childcare in Europe where they can contribute about £200 a month for childcare for a full-term place, a full-time a full place. I think in Edinburgh at the moment people are paying something like £1,100 to £1,300 a month. And any Nordic friends I have who come over here are just kind of, what? I mean, again, I've said that, and everyone's just looking back at me. Perhaps you're, you're of an age uh, where you're too young or on the other end of having wings. But come on, there's a big difference there. So the aim is to have excellent childcare facilities like that. But actually, that sort of begins to make you feel a little bit more like paying, for ta paying your taxes. If you see stuff coming back, you will use. And equally, the Swedes have got the best old folks care in the world, and that's largely part of their project to allow 50-year-old women to remain in the workplace. Because if you don't, what you end up having is women about my age looking after their mothers who are in their 80s and 90s. So this is done not just you know, uh, as, as a kind of piece of fairness, but it's also done with an eye to the, to the jobs markets, which uh, they are much more aware of, they have much much higher use of women in the workplace. And to all of those things, that's welfare. It's um, one of the Danes that came over to talk about it, said that you must have that higher level of women actually in work to, to pay taxes to maintain the welfare tail. And I think that's quite a good way of putting it actually, because that, that kind of way of working, that's a normal social democracy. Okay, that's it working well, but surely that's what we're aspiring to. Instead, I mean, pitiful, shameful, appalling, spying, yep. and uh, presumption about the way people live, humiliating situations. I'm, I'm a patron of, the Scottish, of Scottish motor neuron disease, and people with terminal conditions are having to demonstrate how they can and cannot expect to live, and to be able to prove whether they can have a spare room to have their wife or partner live in the next bed because nobody can sleep with them anymore. They twitch so much. It's shocking that we're doing that. So that's, that's wrong. You know, we know, again, we know that's what we don't want. What we need to get clear is what we do want. And what you then end up is with, you know, Conservatives and Labour now, shamefully, saying, well, of course, we need to make economies and so on. Yes, that's probably true. And actually, it's true, too, that a lot of the Nordic systems have some contribution. I mentioned there that you cannot pay more than £200 per month for a nursery place. You don't get free kindergarten. There is a contribution by most people, but £200 a month, um, in fact, in terms of the different uh, currencies, that really works out at £100 a month here. 
So we could discuss some of those things because the extra bit that goes in from those contributions manages to keep the quality high and that's another reason people keep using the service. So to me that's all the right kind of conversations we have been over here. The idea you want to kind of stigmatise somebody because they need to have someone to help them because they are terminally ill, that's not the right one. About um, feminine male and feminine men, masculine countries, and it occurred to me that that sort of linked up with issues around joined up thinking, and I wondered whether you saw the fe another aspect of the feminine side as being more disposed to joined up. For joined up thinking. I mean, I'm thinking within the area, for example, public health. You have in the, you have in the book, I think, an example of psychohelmets and, you know, doling out, and trying to encourage kids to, to wear cycle helmets. Whereas the real issue is really about how the, how the roads are organised and whether the roads are actually made safe for people. And broader issues, which also, I mean, you know, which issues, this relates also to the issue about why people can't run, can't, why people can't run for a bus. Um, because health is basically not something that, except in an elite sense, which we all say marvellous, um, uh, coming games and stuff, um, is not, I mean, it's not as much on the, I mean, it is on the public health agenda, of course it is, but, you know, that, yeah, that seems point. to be where the emphasis is, and this is all about joined up, this is all about encouraging joined up thinking, and I just wondered whether you saw that as being part of it, and the role that you saw that as having in, in, in New Scotland. Yeah. Yes, and you hit on the Scottish psyche, and then I have some friends who are news, you know, and they say, oh, well, you can't, you're thinking with your heart, you're not thinking with your head, and this is what I get all the time, you know. Now, what you say to that is you say, well, no, I'm thinking with my head, I'm trying to find out as much as possible, but this is what you, this is what you get. I've got other ones that are quite... Um, still a bit like that, but and one you definitely know. But um, what do, what do you say to them? I get that. Okay. You get that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've been so inspired listening to you, Leslie. Thank you very much. Um, can you, as you've travelled around and attended meetings like this, do you have an idea of how the Yes campaign is going? And also, if it's no, how are people like? What's it going to be like for people like us? What's our next step? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I don't know this. Mm. Yeah. Uh, no, that's, well, actually, yes, you can raise your system. And the Scottish Government uh, commissioned a paper on mine before, and it came out recently. Um, regardless of what the, what the outcome of the referendum is, how can we make them put it into action? Because it, it was a really good paper. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I do have to say, you often find that the gals are asking the sharpest questions <laughs> all the time. And that's not to put anyone else down, but that's probably the most important thing, to be honest, practical thing that we can all do. But anyway, let me just run through some of those. And um, the joined up thinking, um, is that a sort of feminine thing? To me, and, and, and uh, you raised the question of the cycle helmets, let me just explain a little bit how, where that kind of came from, because it typified something. Um, I was I was oh, I was talking to one MSP, Michelle remained nameless, it was a Labour MSP. I was talking and he'd actually been at a meeting where we spent two hours talking about how Copenhagen transformed itself into a city where fifty-seven percent of people commute to school or work on a bike. Uh, Thirty years ago it was like Edinburgh, albeit not as hilly, but it didn't have that same cycle take up. And I, I, the, the people from Copenhagen have gone through in enormous detail how they basically changed road space. So they had Copenhagen lanes, some of you may be familiar with them, which are separate from both the pavement and the road. And that, they give priority to cyclists. And you feel absolutely okay in them because you're not, you're not actually sharing the road with traffic. Um, as a result, most people in, in the Copenhagen don't wear cycle helmets. 88% of people say they would stop cycling if they had to wear a cycle helmet. Because it's actually, you'll have noticed the same if you go to Amsterdam. You don't see people actually arming up themselves to take on a car. It's an unequal battle, folks. What you need is the protection of proper design. That's what makes you feel confident to cycle. 
So having sat through this entire meeting, this MSP came up to me at the end and started telling me about a project he'd been in during that day, cycle, handing out cycle helmets to kids. And I just thought, I don't know, were you even listening there? Because that is so... Now, I don't think this is... I wouldn't characterise it myself as joined up thinking. I think what we've got into in Scotland is kind of pilot-itis. Everything is a pilot project. Everything is short-term and one-off. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know what works now. We don't need more pilots on half of this. We need the courage to, to change mainstream behaviour. I mean, in nearly all these cases, the evidence is all there, for example, for the benefit of early years education, mercifully and largely due to uh, the late um, Ilsa Mackay, Professor Ilsa Mackay. The SNP at least got that message and have got that as part of their offer for post-independence. But in so many circumstances, we're continually doing one-off pilots to see if it works. Then the money, you know, there's, it's there for a year, then it goes, then leave it for five years until that cohort of people are completely hacked off, demoralised, and perhaps moved on to something else. And blow me, then it comes again as a pilot. We'll be doing this until we're dead. Silence. It is silos, but it's more than that. It's a deep-seated fear of mainstream, the things that work, for fear of, of, of annoying the establishment. You know, we've got to get to a stage, and what's happening, for example, is um, if you find something isn't working, or there isn't sufficient conversation between the little people who don't get to say, you know, don't get to speak or be heard, then what happens is an overarching umbrella group is set up, by gum, there's more jobs for certain subsections of the population, to liaise with all these people. We liaise, we consult. Do you know, those two words are not as much heard in proper democracies because there you hear the words control. What happens there is the little people, the local people or whatever you like, are running the thing. And they don't need to keep being consulted all the time on things because actually they're running it. I mean, you do not hear now much about the people on the island of Egg being consulted about things. They are kind of running it. So, you know, these things which sound virtuous and sound good, it's always thought of as good if you want to consult people, because the opposite is, is thought to be being high-handed and autocratic. Beware that parallel, because actually very, very much of the time, consultation is happening because power is held here. I am the one who chooses to consult you. I can choose not to. I can choose not to abide by anything you say to me. I can choose to appear to hear it and not enact it. I can choose to enact it and not enforce it. All those things are consistent with power staying with me, not with you. So all of that, all of that is the outcome. That's the kind of symptoms of the disease of top-down elitism. And we have to get wise to it. I don't want to be consulted on anything else now. I refuse to be involved with pilot projects. No, no, no. It's a, it's a kind of, it's a junkie-like habit, people. Get it up. Yes, there was a, a few other points. Um, the head and the heart, Lark. Yes, this is an odd one. Because, I mean, basically, my head... Uh, my head is telling me a lot of things in this referendum. My heart, I'm not quite sure, you know, I don't let my heart get involved in this to a large degree because I'm wary of people who are very emotionally led about some things, particularly the business of the flag and the kind of, you know, past like is bit. That's never really, I've never been very comfortable with that. It's my head that's telling me, and I, I realise I have had the good fortune to travel to a lot of Nordic countries to speak to a lot of people who are not dissimilar than, than, than us, in fact, whose genetic stock I personally share. Um, and I, I realise we could be running this country just far better. That's the head that talks every single time. I, I'm, not, I'm just not happy to accept that what we currently have to put up with is the best that we can do for this place. So actually, it's my head that's pretty well on, on shout all the time. Um, and I, I, whichever the other favourite statistics that you have, everybody's different. That's the other thing. I'm not at all impressed uh, when there is one, again, top-down message that everybody seems to feel the need to kind of spout. I think people are most effective when they're authentic. So some things will matter most to you, 
I personally, you know, have got things I've seen that matter about land resources and so on, but choose your own. And I think those are the sort of things that, that seem to me to be the, the, the motivators for most people, I find. And yes, you can get emotional about it because, yeah, now we're getting to a stage where this thing could all possibly happen. Um, and just a couple, how, um, how is Yes doing around the place? Honestly, I find it very hard to know. I mean, meetings are styled out absolutely everywhere. I don't th I think it's months since I've been at a meeting that's had a fewer than 100 people, apart from perhaps this slightly perfectly formed audience, on the very, very top floor of a, of a hard to find building. But and then, actually, that's a, that's a strange characteristic. Meetings, I find, sometimes in cities are thinner than actually, I've been in Stewarton, Castle Mill, Burnham, Stonehaven in the last three days, and there was a hundred, more than a hundred people at each of those meetings. So yeah, the folk are very animated, but there's a, I've seen a hundred people. The, the population of each of those areas is tens of thousands. So who can say? I think the the um, the results of the mass canvas that uh, the Radical Independence campaign have done are interesting. They surveyed eighteen thousand people in the housing estates of Scotland, and many of these people had never been registered to vote, perhaps even more interestingly, they couldn't have been um, they couldn't have been contacted by most of the conventional polling companies because they don't have landlines. I mean, it's, it's, it astonishes me that people don't pick this up, but um, one in seven of Scots don't have landlines in their homes. Those people cannot be contacted by most pollers who use, who will not use mobile phones. So the people in the state, and that's largely that one in seven, and um, those folk cannot have been contacted for, for decades, you know, a long time. Um, so that's, that's a, a hopeful thought, and personally speaking, I'm putting most of my energies now into those housing estate areas, and I'd also like to see buses going in on the actual day so that we get a kind of bit of a party atmosphere going, and the celebrities that we have, I mean, the genuine ones that people can point at and go, go that's Olivia MacArthur off River City, those kind of people should be out on the 18th on those blinking buses, giving it a good time feel. Um, I have phoned <coughs> a couple of times to Yes Scott to see if that's actually happening. I'm not at all persuaded that it is, because I keep meeting people like Ricky Ross, I met four times yesterday, and said to him four times, um, what are you doing on the actual 18th? And he said, no one's contacted me. Well, no. So I think there's some organization to be done for the, the very final bit, but I, I wouldn't say we keep meeting people who are like-minded. Don't you can't be fooled by that, you know. But on the other hand, wow, you know, you've got to say uh, it is extraordinary to sit amongst usually meetings of people who are very activist-oriented as well. I usually meet no half the people in the room for other things we've all done before whether it's been land stuff or community buyouts or food cooperatives or <coughs> setting up allotments or stuff like that. These are the doers in life, I find mostly. Although I appreciate that too could be a generalization. Um, and finally, finally on the land reform review group. Is that your one? Yes. Um, th this, this was an astonishing report actually, which came up with four big things that will transform Scotland. One is the end of primogeniture, you know I was telling you before about the other son plan, out. That's one proposal. Second proposal is to have a maximum acreage of land per interest or person. Now, that's a stunner actually, because that's not British. The British way of dealing with anything is that, that there is never too much. There is no maximum cap on anything. And you don't interfere with the market. So, you know, the, the Brits will not interfere with someone's right to buy whatever the hell they like no matter who they are, what lack of experience they have about cultural stuff, how much they've already got, no, that doesn't matter in the British framework of thinking because there's never too much. That's a very Nordic piece of legislation because that's actually common in all the Nordics that you have you can't own more than certain amounts or in Denmark you need to, I think still, have done five years in agriculture in college before you can buy farming land. Now that fairly sorts out your chicken clues from your fair so, you know. um, so those kind of things, again coming back to the earlier point, those things which are normal in social democracies, that you look at very valuable assets and you decide it matters who has them and how much they have, that normal 
is being imported for the first time into our thinking by that provision that's being pr pr proposed in the Land Reform Review Group's recommendation. So it's really important. Third one, um, and Professor Jim Hunter uh, thinks this is the most important one actually, is a tenant's right to buy. Because after all, there are tenants already on the land, so allowing them to buy the land they're already on would also break up the large estates. And here's an extraordinary one, which you also may not know is currently the case. Um, landowners who own sporting estates should be made to pay business rates. They yeah. don't. Mm. Really? And when, I mean, lots of people find that out. They say, what? Shocking. Now, none of this, none of those four proposals actually turns you into a radical revolutionary. <laughs> Most all of them simply return you to where the rest of Europe has roughly been for a hundred years. But we can do can that. We get the government to start adopting this and making it happen. Sure. I just wanted to make sure everyone knew what provisions yeah, were first of all, yeah. because if you don't know how revolutionary this can be, you won't get as excited as you and I are about the possibility that this can happen. So anyway, after that re re review group reported, two weeks later, the SNP government um, promised that they would introduce a land reform act uh, to the Scottish Parliament before the Holyrood elections, so that's before 2016. Not that it would complete its passage, but that it would be introduced. Now, as you quite rightly say, the $65,000 question is what's going to be in the act? Mm -hmm. Will it be, be these big muscular provisions that I've just outlined, or will it be some pathy other things which are not basically going to make the change? In effect, to, to, to borrow the parlance of somebody that might be your partner, or you might just be sitting beside and waving at, <laughs> and who earlier talked about that sort of um, uh, the joined up thinking, you know, where we end up with just tokenistic stuff. We do not want that. We want yeah. these things. Now, who can say how that will be forced through, except that I can say to you, every single meeting I've been at since September the 9th, when this book was launched, and that's now 125 meetings, every single meeting, if land isn't the first thing that's mentioned, it's the second. Um, so, you know, people want this change to happen, not just because people are very connected with land, sadly or not, but it's the biggest demonstrator of unfairness mm -hmm. in our society. And we do actually want to be connected back out to land. We, we sort of know that it's not right. So I think we have to, I'll certainly be on this case, you know, as soon as we get the referendum out of the way, that is my number one thing. Andy Whiteman, who some of you may know, who wrote The Poor Had No Lawyers, which is a great book, has given his life, actually, to the pursuit of trying to demonstrate how unfair land ownership in Scotland is. Andy, and this is a promising sign at least, has been talking to a number of ministers. Andy, as some of you will know in the room, is not someone who suffers bills, not even gladly, just not even at all. So the fact he's still talking to them seems promising. But make no mistake, there are a lot of people within the SNP who do not want these changes. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of people who find it threatening. Because no one has ever in Britain looked, well not ever, the, the deal after the, uh, after the Second World War was a considerable change and a, a breach, if you like, in establishment rule. But we've been through two wars to get that level of courage up. Now what's being proposed is to stare right down the gun of the establishment barrel, if you like, right? Right, stare right down that barrel, or rather off that gun, and say, actually, we are going to change this. And that takes a lot of courage, and it takes all of us making it clear to the government that we want this to happen. And we need to do that in all sorts of different ways. But I mean, the Commonweal, Radical Independence Convention, the National Collective, the Jimmy Reed Foundation, um, and Loud Mouse like me, uh, to be able to plan that period after the referendum so that that agenda doesn't get lost. Yeah. So all I can say is watch this space because we're kind of busy at the moment doing the referendum. Okay. We've got four, <laughs> four, four minutes left and I think there's about six hands waiting for, well that's five. Uh, no, 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 I mean, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, let's, just go, five. let's go through them and be cruel to people who've already asked questions, sorry. Okay, so that's four. So, gentlemen here, then the gentleman here, then the gentleman here, and then, then there. So, yeah. Given all that we've heard today, how can you explain the phenomenon in a socialist country like of willingness of labour supporters to work for independence when that would be the best prospect for them achieving things presumably they want to achieve? Okay. 
I just wanted to say um, how much was enjoyed Blossom, and it, it chimed um, very closely with my experience of working on Tyree, um, visiting Finland, um, becoming self-employed. One thing I think that it's, uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on and other people, is um, I think we need to look at our yardstick. Right now, um, the, the plan is for drugs and prostitution to be included in our GDP um, and to change the status of, of, of uh, states of, of, of military weapons to be included in GDP. We have to, we're giving yardsticks, we're giving statistics about employment, um, we're being given yardsticks and told what success is and what those yardsticks are. I think what we need to do is look at the yardsticks. That's kind of, uh, it's a bit, you kind of touched on it in terms of saying, or oh, is success at a couple of points better than anything? Well, that, I think we have to think a lot more uh, about what those measures are in regards to And one final question here. We, on the S side of the process, there's been a lot of new and powerful voices coming through. And that was far beyond the existing part of political structures. I can see the potential for more independent MSPs to come forward, potentially. Um, I'd like to wish with you whether, whether you have any aspirations to stand in public office, <laughs> and whether you see any potential in a second chamber. It's not presently proposed, but what potential that might be. Right, we do, actually. Uh, I th potentially, I think we do. We don't, the trouble is, you, you know, the, the House of Lords has given second chambers a bad name. But in many, many countries, and again, coming back to most social democracies, there are two chambers. Um, they, they act as a check, and you can have lots of different ways of running them. Um, sometimes they can be, uh, they can represent the geographical spread of a country. Sometimes they are selected. Um, we need to explore that a bit more. Um, it's a long, it, it, there's not enough time to go into this here, but um, the danger is that if you have just one parliament, it is very run by parties. Obviously it is. Do you have any idea how many people in Scotland are members of a political party? 1%. So that is basically 1% of people become the cohort who end up choosing who is able to stand, who you are able to vote for, who then has complete control over, over everything. Now, there's lots of other countries who don't think that's a great model. And I, I would just urge us all not to respond too much to the idea of a second chamber simply because it brings in George Powers. Um, I shouldn't be nasty to George because he's actually a guest on Referendum TV tomorrow, which is one of the many projects that you were talking about, but it these spin-off things. If any of you haven't watched it, please watch it because there's only two more episodes of it and then all the volunteers are gone away. Um, but yes, the question of, um, I'm just picking them up slightly at random here, uh, parties and MSP, I, I don't think, <laughs> um, I have a very low tolerance for meetings <laughs> and, and basically pointlessness in life um, and I think I have predisposed myself to being unemployable and probably not anybody's able to sit very easily in any chamber anywhere and not be very disruptive for no reason at all actually but just because I can. So knowing what I'm like, I don't think I would make an ideal MSP, although it's very sweet that anyone might think I would. But more to the point, I think there are vast numbers of people who are coming forward now and having a completely different idea about what it would be to be a representative. And I think the parties watch out. Because so many people, many meetings I've gone to all over Scotland, the one pe set of people they do not want to hear from, politicians. The people who are in most demand to speak are people who are speaking from the heart and have no axe to grind in party political ways. But that too is an expression of the distrust we have, even in Scotland, towards people who want to be politicians. And actually that has to be remedied because it's a good thing to want to be. It's like the House of Lords thing, we've pushed back against the idea of politicians because so, much, so many of them, within the wider British context, have been found wanting. But we must create that trust again. It's the mark of a democracy that you can trust one another. Let me give you an example. If you go onto an airplane somewhere here, and you better do it fast before the Icelandic volcano goes up, we'll all be sitting here for another six months. But anyway, if you go onto a British carrier, how often is your, is your ticket checked? Probably about 50 times when you get to your actual seat. If you go onto any of, of the carriers in the rest of Northern Europe, it's checked once because they trust that the system works and the other guys who checked it wouldn't let you have got that far unless they checked your ticket. 
In this country, we never trust the rest of the system because it could be crap. And it generally is. So, you know, we must get to a stage where we have more trust again. Right, I do need to run on. Um, Labour and independence, why is that bizarre? Um, do you support football team, sir? Yes. Which is it? Rutherford and Oh, you sweetie. <laughs> Rutherford and what? Thank you. Right. So, uh, Did you ever yeah. conceive of, of supporting some other team? Yes, I have. I have other teams. Right. I supported Ferdinand. I then moved on to Clyde, who ended up near the north of the well, by okay. the by well, the actual support. Let me ask why, why I was asking, which is just there are many loyalties in life that people find it very, very hard to give up. And cheerfully, if you're not one of them, which is probably why you're asking the question, you have flexibility in your um, in your support. But I mean, a lot of I find it more puzzling that most of the guys in this country seem seem to pivot around what Ronnie or what's his name from Norway is doing with Celtic. You know, I don't, I don't understand why this seems to be a pivot and a deep, deep seated loyalty that people can't seem to get over, and yet it is. So that I mean, obviously, people have big loyalties in life that they don't easily give up, and politics isn't the only one. So, you know, I, I can understand why lots of Labour people find it very hard to get their heads around independence because the party they've supported all their lives is is basically telling them not to do it. And for a lot of people, although you'd like to think we're all free thinkers, um, that feels quite scary to depart from that grid line, that 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 guiding star, if you like. So, sure. I know, but there's a difference. You asked a question a particular way. Yeah. You asked, did I understand? Yeah. And, I, you know, I understand all sorts of things I don't agree with. Yeah. And now that makes me thought sound like blooming Buddha. <laughs> what I mean is, one can understand lots of dynamics in life which one does not agree with. And there's no point in sort of saying to people, I can't understand why you don't See, I regard it as a sort of eccentric person. The latest post is 37% of Labour right. voters who voted in the Scottish Parliament elections actually voted independence. Yes. Otherwise, I don't the vote. Vote. There's a lot of Labour voters. Yeah. Labour for independence leaflets are going on. There is, but that too wasn't the question. So it's the same regardless as an eccentric. Right, well, actually, you probably are. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>